So today's lecture is going to be on argument construction and rebuttal. So there are two different aspects to that, of course. Let's see here. Can everyone see my screen? Zayn, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. So yeah, argument construction and rebuttal. So uh, we'll do the two sides. First is about the arguments, then rebuttal, which is like the opposite of that, trying to take down someone else's arguments. We'll then have a short Q&A if anyone has any questions before we go on to our practice debate for today. So on arguments, there are four main sections that come within an argument. The first is the claim. This is just the most basic kind of statement of what you're arguing about, of what you claim to be true. And that's just a short one sentence, usually a headline. Secondly is the proof or the analysis. This comes chronologically prior to your argument and is what explains why an argument is true or not. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Thirdly, you have examples or illustrations. Uh, this is exactly what it sounds like. You either give a real world example of maybe some specific country in which the motion it has already been passed and then maybe what occurred in that country because of the motion or illustrations are more on the side of you create a hypothetical scenario where you explain how a certain person would act based on the motion they're interacting with and then fourth and finally is impacts this is something that comes like chronologically after your argument and it's used to explain to the judge why your argument is important and what are the consequences of your argument. So just note that each of these four components are extremely important and they, uh, they all need to be together for it to be a solid argument. So as for the claim, this is the title of the argument. This is um, if you just said the claim by itself, someone should be able to understand what the argument is. So the claim might be something like, oh, the car industry is going to benefit economically. That could be your claim. And then everything around that supports your initial claim uh, as to <clears throat> why the car industry would uh, benefit. And so this is just a very short summary of your argument and should be quite concise. Within your speech, a singular claim should appear twice. First, when you signpost it at the start of your speech. So if you remember from yesterday's lecture, uh, in your speech, you should start off with an introduction where you signpost or kind of summarize the rest of your speech. And so in your signposting, you should be saying the claim of each of your arguments. So if you have three arguments, you'll say something along the lines of, I'll be giving three arguments within my speech. Firstly, the car industry is going to benefit greatly. Secondly, yada, 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 and so on. And so the second time your claim comes up is when you actually get to the argument within the contents of your speech. So you've already said it in your introduction. And then when you actually arrive at the argument, maybe after a minute or, of rebuttal or something, then you want to remind the judge uh, what's the topic you're going to be talking about and what the next few like sentences of your speech are focused around. So um, we can use the example of the sugar tax again. Uh, an argument here or the claim would be that imposing a sugar tax reduces the consumption of unhealthy food. So it's quite straightforward. It's just one sentence and it gets the point across. Moving on to proof and analysis. So this is uh, when you're explaining why your argument is true. And uh, it often comes in the form of a mechanism, which is a debating term for a singular piece of analysis. 
So a kind of a logical link which connects the motion to the argument you're trying to make. Because usually they're not so like obvious or intuitive that you can just state your argument and the judge will just believe that it's true. In the case of the sugar tax, the motion is only talking about a sugar tax. That's all the motion talks about. And so for you to jump straight to like people eating less unhealthy food is a quite is quite a big jump. There are a lot of logical links that come in between those two points, which you need to thoroughly explain for anyone to believe that your argument is actually true. And you also have to remember that the more pieces of analysis that you have, the better your argument is going to be. So quite often, um, people just give one piece of analysis. They just try connecting the motion to their argument with a single strand of logic. And overall, that's just very weak because the opposition speaker can come up. They can destroy your like singular piece of analysis in a variety of ways, and then your argument does not stand anymore then maybe your partner has to come up and rebuild it. But overall, what you want is the first time you bring out an argument, you have multiple pieces of analysis supporting it so that it's very difficult for anyone to say that the argument is not true. Uh, and yeah, so each strand of analysis is going to support your argument in some way. So uh, overall, I'd say, if you wanted to choose between having lots of different arguments, so like let's say having five or six different arguments uh, that prove that like support your side of the motion, or taking the other option of having maybe two or three arguments, but each argument has three pieces of analysis backing it up, then you should go with the second option. It's a lot better to have very strong points um, that uh, support your side of the motion rather than having like a sh shotgun approach of just like going for six different points and none of them are that well thought out or well developed. Okay, does that make sense? If anyone has any questions, uh, just speak up. I'll wait five or 10 seconds. Um, in this, uh, can we do it like uh, in like case wise, like in the first case when we are dealing with uh, particular stakeholder and their analysis and then a different stakeholder and their analysis like that. In yeah, the... definitely. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Uh, a lot of the time you might have like arguments based around different stakeholders, but yeah, analysis can also be focused around stakeholders. And in fact, that's a really good way to structure um, your thoughts during prep time. If you are able to look at different groups of people that are affected by the motion, then uh, you can uh, kind of think of more points of analysis or more arguments since you're able to look at from those different perspectives. And it really covers your bases from a judge's perspective because then the judge knows, okay, they've really thought it through and um, their argument works for all of these different groups of people. Yeah, great. Uh, so is the, the proof of analysis is done after you state your claim? Yeah, so generally speaking, this is probably the order you're going to go in. You'll start off with the claim of what you're trying to prove. Then you'll explain the reasons why it's true uh, and so on, going into examples and then finally the impacts. Okay, so <clears throat> on to examples. So examples um, can be a double-edged sword, in my opinion. I'd say it's definitely a good tool if you're able to um, fit it into having your uh, reasons, your like analysis along with your impacts. But if anything else is lacking and you rely too much on the examples, then that's going to lead to a very weak argument. So I would put examples as more of a kind of cherry on top of, yes, it's still necessary and it's definitely going to add a lot to your argument, but it's not going to be the substance of your argument. So what an example is, is a like real world evidence that supports your argument or hypothetical uh, evidence that supports your argument in a similar way. And this could be a statistic. I, I wouldn't recommend it being a direct statistic, like in the sense that you might think of something like numbers. That's not usually very convincing, 
but a statistic in the sense of a real um place in the world where certain events have occurred that would still be very useful in trying to um kind of paint a picture to the judge of what this actually looks like because if you're able to point out a country where a sugar tax was implemented and then uh let's say the obesity rate fell by uh like 50 percent then uh like that really shows to the judge that okay if the same sugar tax is implemented in another country it's definitely possible that these things might happen of course you haven't actually explained why obesity f um like fell so much and that's like the key point that actually needs to be explained but it at least gets the point across that your argument is not completely ridiculous that your argument is actually feasible in certain scenarios and then other than that more like real world example, you can do a more illustrative example where you just talk through maybe the mindset of a certain group of people or the thought process of the consumer who wants to buy this sugary product. Uh, if you're able to fully walk the judge through why they take any action, then it's quite thorough in the sense of the judge knows exactly why they choose to buy less sugary foods or something along those lines. And this doesn't have to be like a specific person. This doesn't have to be um, like something that actually happened. You are just creating it and uh, like you're, you're creating it yourself, but it's phrased and characterized in a way which makes it more relatable, more realistic. And as if it's the same as a real person trying to buy this sugary product. <clears throat> so if you're able to fully go um, explain how this person acts and their incentives, then that could be very useful as well. Okay, finally, moving on to impacts. So an impact shows why your argument is important, especially in the context of the debate. So uh, quite often this might be uh, relating to maybe other arguments that you've brought up or other arguments which the opposition has brought up and then you show how your argument maybe like undercuts theirs or um just comes like chronologically prior to theirs uh an example might be that if an opposition argument hinges on the fact that like sugar is still quite commonly used in this new world with a sugar tax and then you are able to prove that alternatives to sugar are created instead because sugar is more expensive then that kind of destroys um the other person's argument without even you having to directly rebut them but uh you have to point that out explicitly so you need to be the one to tell the judge look i've given you this argument which directly contradicts my oppositions because there's relies on this assumption that sugar still exists in this new world so that's the kind of thing i'm talking about and then you also want to be talking about the benefits of your own um arguments and uh maybe explaining why there aren't harms uh which the judge might assume there are so you want to like handle both sides there so the benefits is like the most straightforward part of it right uh what this looks like is maybe um, your argument is that people who work from home are going to have like a lot less commute and that, uh, so like that's your argument, maybe just like that there's a lot less commute that they have to go through and um, like they're, maybe they waste less time. And indirect impact of that might be things along the lines of, uh, in car industries or train industries um, being affected, uh, things like environmental effects of cars, all of those are impacts. So if you're able to prove then that like the environment has benefited, then that's something that comes after your initial argument of like cars are used less or there's less commute. And then similarly for the sugar tax, um, if uh, you've proven your argument of people eat less junk food or eat less sugar and that they have better health, 
then an impact of that is that there are fewer people who need to go to the hospital because of like obesity or heart disease. And so there's less stress on the healthcare system. And um, this, I guess, mainly applies to maybe more governmental led healthcare systems, not private systems. But even if you, even if it's only in those cases, it's still a very important point. Okay, uh, once again, any questions? I'll wait five or 10 seconds. I have a question on the illustrations part. Um, is it like okay if we use an uh like a scenario in which is not exactly what is talked about, but something similar? Like let's say a uh, salt tax has been implemented in some country, then we can use that uh, its impacts as something to do with the sugar tax when you're illustrating. You definitely can because most of it is about like intuition if you're able to just show the judge that this is a very intuitive argument and that it's something that should be believed then it's fine but of course like the further you stray from the actual motion the less relevant your examples become and the less believable they are as to that they'll also apply in this specific scenario so of course um you're going to have a stronger example if it's more relevant to the motion. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Would you mind again defining mechanization? I think I'd like to understand that a bit better. Yeah. So uh, it comes down to reasons why something is true. And a, mechani a mechanism is a specific reason, usually. Just um, so let's see here. Sorry. Uh, okay, so in the case of the sugar tax, maybe the maybe the opposition is trying to say that um, people will still buy as many sugary products. That's their argument, that they won't decrease their amount of sugary products. And then a mechanism for that is that um, buying sugary products is a habitual process. And so the price tag is uh, not something very like clearly um, like thought of when uh, trying to buy the sugary product. Or similarly, on the other side, if you're trying to prove that people will buy less, then a mechanism would be um, people from like poorer backgrounds are very budget conscious. They need to figure out exactly how much money they're going to spend when they take a trip to the store and they want to make sure that they're not like going over budget. And so their highest concern is going to be buying the cheapest product, which is why they'll end up maybe buying one of the healthier options, which is now cheaper relatively. Okay. So yeah, just to summarize, these are the four main uh, components of your argument, claim, proof, examples, impacts. So now let's move on to rebuttal. So it's quite similar in the sense of you're talking about the same types of components. You still have that analysis, you have those examples, you have those impacts, but now these are the things which your, op your opposition has just said. What your job is, is attacking these three components and explaining why they're not that important or they're not true. So for example, analysis. Your opposition has just given you two reasons as to why their argument is true, and you now need to deconstruct that in order to prove that the argument does not work. So you want to attack at the analysis to uh, disprove its like veracity. So <clears throat> there are a few main things you want to be looking for. The first one is the easiest to disprove usually, which is un uh, like supported assertions. So this might look like someone just blurting out that, oh, if you have a sugar tax, then that means um, these junk food products are uh, cost five times as much and that people can't buy them at all and that people are starving. You know, these are like huge leaps in logic, um, which like go completely unproven. And so you stand up, you say, okay, five times as expensive, that's completely ridiculous. In the majority of cases, this is going to look like a 10% increase at most. 
and then you explain why that's the case. Things like how profit margins are so slim and how these kinds of industries are already uh, are so efficient in their production that um, they try giving the lowest cost to their consumers or else they would go out of business. Things along those lines. If you're able to fully explain why something like the price increasing fivefold is uh, completely ridiculous, then that uh, gets rid of this unproven assertion. Second would be missing links. So this is similar, but it's usually a very specific uh, point which the opposition might have forgotten to explain and which you can then exploit. So um, yeah, it's, it's mainly similar to what the goal of analysis is, right? You're trying to get from the motion to your argument through a, a list of like logical steps. A missing link is maybe one or two steps which the opposition has forgotten to include. And so if you're able to, maybe you don't even have to do much. If you're able to identify that there's a missing link and you point that out to the judge and then maybe spend a sentence or so explaining why it's a link that's impossible to fill in, it's just such a crucial part of the argument, then that explains to the judge that the argument as a whole or that piece of analysis is completely wrong. And finally, third of all, is something called the comparative. So this, you'll hear this term quite often. It's basically just saying, compare the proposition side of the motion to the opposition side and the different worlds that they're trying to argue for. So if proposition stands up and says, okay, uh, we have like um, a lesser, uh, a, um, so we have less of a burden on the healthcare system and they've given a reason why that's true. Opposition can say that, oh, because of this reason, we also have uh, the same benefit on our side. And so it doesn't really matter that proposition has these benefits because it's not exclusive to their side. Uh, they forgot that it's not actually the like key difference in the motion, which leads to that effect. It's more something that's just always going to be true. So if you're able to explain how like two things, uh, how something's true on both sides of the motion, then it basically means that it's not relevant anymore. Okay. Uh, does it make sense? Okay. Moving on. So attacking examples. There are two ways in which you can attack an example. First is trying to use the same example which your opposition has just brought up. So if you're able to get down at this like their level and use the same example as them, then it's very clear to the judge how you've engaged with their argument, how you've disproven them, if you're able to do it effectively. But of course, that's quite difficult. And so in some cases, your opposition is going to give an example, which is just very clearly true. There's almost no way for you to say that the example itself is false. But what you can still do in these scenarios is explain why the example is not relevant to the debate. So maybe they've given a example which makes an underlying assumption that this person has a lot of money. And so if you're able to explain that we don't really care that much about the rich um, buying more or less junk food, and that's not that important to the debate, then you can uh, kind of push their example outside of what the judge considers to be relevant. So if you're able to go into the specifics of what their example is actually about, and then maybe point something out which isn't too important, then that can uh, weaken the example as a whole. Uh, just to give an example on the flipping illustrations point of using the same example as your opposition. So uh, once again, in the sugar tax case, that just looks like uh, one team saying, okay, so we go through the thought process of a consumer, they're going to be looking at the price tag a lot, uh, and then you come up, use the same example of the consumer, and then explain why um, when something's habitual, you don't look at the price tag. So that kind of thing. Of course, you don't want this to turn into just like uh, two sides asserting opposites, where you're, one side is just saying, 
my thing, my example is true, and then the other side says, no, my example is true. Once again, even with these examples, you want to have some logical reasoning in there, which is the kind of substance that can fight against the other side. Finally, impacts. So there are three ways in which you can attack an impact. So an impact, just as a reminder, is something along the lines of the healthcare system is not burdened as much because of lower uh, like consumption of sugar and lower cases of obesity. The first way to attack this impact is talking about relevancy. So maybe you prove or you like try to prove that the most important thing in this debate is not the healthcare system, that we shouldn't care too much about the healthcare system. What matters a lot more are the consumers and the businesses that are selling the sugar. And if your side of the motion is able to prove that you benefit the like businesses to a very great extent, then maybe you can try saying that the healthcare system isn't that important. They can probably deal with the numbers that they are like uh, having to handle with something along those lines. Secondly, you have mitigation. This is saying that, okay, maybe the healthcare system is going to be burdened because of obesity rates, but it's not going to be burdened that much. Like they have much other, like worse things to worry about other than obesity, right? Things like, um, like, uh, like diseases, trying to find cures and uh, develop vaccines. All of these things cost a lot of money and lots of research and development. And so the like marginal extra work that they have to do because of like higher obesity rates isn't actually that important. So in more abstract terms, mitigation is just trying to decrease the importance of someone's argument or say that it's it's true or it might be true, but it's not as like impactful as the opposition tries to claim. And maybe it only affects a small number of people and only like loses the companies like a very small amount of money, something like that, trying to decrease uh, the effects of the opposition's argument. Lastly, you have um, weighing. So what this is saying is, okay, maybe it's completely true. Maybe the opposition, what they've said is totally true, but on our side, the argument that I've just given is more oh, important. Mama. Sorry, Ayush, could you mute? Uh, okay, so yeah, so you're just saying that the argument that you've given um, has much greater impacts and effects. And so maybe uh, the opposition's argument uh, like decreases obesity by a small amount, but your argument boosts the like nation's economy like twofold and doubles um, the amount of cash flow coming into the country, right? Like, I'm not sure how you would prove that necessarily for this motion, but the point is more just if you're able to prove that the effects that you've shown are much more relevant and much more important, then you can win the debate like that. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, so this is the last slide. Uh, we'll finish off the lecture quickly. So there are a few final tips I have for when you're doing rebuttal. The first thing is you need to make sure everyone in the debate is aware of what exactly you are rebutting. So before you, <coughs> sorry, before you give your response, you need to explain the argument that you're responding to. And you don't want to spend too much time on this, but you want to say maybe one sentence on, okay, the prime minister or opening government gave us this argument on how uh, obesity rates decrease. In response, I'd like to argue da 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 da, something along those lines so that everyone's aware of what you're responding to. And that uh, gives a lot more structure to your like rebuttal section of your speech. Um, and then this next thing is you want to be rebutting the opposition in their best case scenario. So you don't just want to like say, okay, um, actually, so the best way to explain this is you don't want to rephrase a opposition argument in weaker terms than it was originally explained in. So this is called straw manning someone's argument. 
which is giving a more simplified version or a weaker version of the argument than uh, actually stated. And then you rebut this weaker argument and act as if you've rebutted the stronger original claim. Uh, overall, this just isn't a good strategy because you're not giving credit where it's due. You're not actually rebutting the argument which was stated. You're basically making up a random argument of your own and then rebutting that and acting as if your rebuttal was actually worthwhile. So what you need to do is make sure you listen out for uh, what the opposition actually said, and then um, make sure you explain to the judge that you're taking them at their best case. So what this often looks like is using the phrase even if. So maybe you say, okay, <clears throat> panel, what the this point on like obesity being decreased, firstly, I'd like to mitigate it by explaining how, um, you know, like a very small number of people would actually be like, affected by this like obesity decrease. But even if you don't believe that, and we take them at their best case scenario where um, like thousands of people, like hundreds of thousands of people are being benefited at, on a health wise basis, even in that case, our arguments are more important because they apply to the businesses, which are like the most relevant stakeholders in this debate. So something like that, where you have multiple pieces of rebuttal. First, you have the mitigation, then you have the weighing, things along those lines. That can be a situation where you take them at their best case. Okay, and last but not least, you want to show the importance of your rebuttal in the context of the debate. So maybe explain that the argument you've just rebutted is uh, the opposition's strongest argument and that without it, they've completely lost the debate, or show why, um, the weighing which you've just done on uh, like obesity being less important than businesses, uh, you can explain how um, obesity was the point which the opposition was relying on to win the debate and how you've proven their strongest um, like kind of factor to be uh, irrelevant. Something along those lines, trying to give a more like bigger picture of the debate and say why you've won. Okay, that's all for now. Uh, any questions or we can just go into our practice debate. Uh, is it a, you, you keep using the phrase like panel to address the audience. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that's some sort of formality, but yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry about that. So uh, panel is generally used to refer to the judge or multiple judges, because multiple judges as a whole are called a panel, that it's a panel of judges. Uh, yeah, and quite often debaters refer to the panel as a whole instead of like individual speakers or judges or something like that. Okay. Yeah, just like jargon, just debate terminology, not too important. 